Good morning, everyone. I am Madiha Nas, a volunteer at Wiki Club AMU, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 22nd DCW Conversation Hour. Before we begin, please note that this session is being recorded. And if you have any concerns, feel free to let us know. Today marks the 22nd DCW Conversation Hour, titled Sustaining Open Knowledge Initiatives. This session emphasizes sustainable knowledge sharing and accessibility. Inspired by the Wikimedia 2030 Movement Strategy, we are joined by Stacey Burnett today, a senior product manager at Ithaca, known for her work managing JSTOR and initiatives like the JSTOR Prison Education Program. Stacey brings invaluable expertise in sustainability and community management. With an MBA, she has a wealth of experience managing initiatives aimed at broadening access to knowledge, including programs like the JSTOR Prison Education. Stacey's expertise in sustainable knowledge sharing aligns perfectly with today's theme. In this edition, our focus will be on sustaining open knowledge initiatives, and we are very fortunate to have Stacey Burnett with us to share her insights. Thank you, Stacey, for joining us today. And with that, I'm honored to hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen to uh, share the presentation. Um, and let me make this the full screen. There we go. Let me go back to the beginning here. Um, great. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to be discussing the um, way that knowledge is shared inside most prisons. And I'd like to apologize in advance if the majority of this presentation is focused on the United States. Um, but uh, with what we have learned, um, I think much of this will be relevant when we're thinking about how um, material is accessed inside. And um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity uh, to share what we've, what we've learned. Uh, so first I'd like to start off that uh, sharing that a little bit about who we are. Ithaca is a nonprofit with a mission to improve access to knowledge and education for people everywhere. And uh, bringing tools like JSTOR into spaces like prison is part of our mission to make sure that everyone has access to knowledge, regardless of where they happen to be. So a little bit about the numbers. Um, in the United States, 78 million people have a conviction history. That's a third of the adult population in this country. 650,000 of those people will return home from prison every year. And 92% don't have any access to the internet at all during their incarceration. 980,000 people now have access to JSTOR all over the world while they are incarcerated at nearly 1,500 sites. We are operating in 21 countries. For instance, all of England and Wales is 88,000 of those uh, nearly million people who have access to JSTOR inside. Um, and Africa is the quickest international geographic location um, that's that's growing. Um, but we also think about the people who are inside and uh, from uh, people who have reached out to us after they were released, 17 of them believe that JSTOR played a crucial role in their ability to regain their freedom. Uh, the other thing that's kind of cool is artificial intelligence enabled products are being used on the JSTOR access in prison uh, platform and uh, to nearly 100,000 people. And uh, that's really remarkable. And I'll, uh, you'll see why, why later. Also, uh, people who are in mental institutions, like criminal mental institutions, 
uh, are often particularly disadvantaged when trying to access information. And here on the right-hand side, you'll see that we are even in uh, the psychiatric facilities, the criminal psychiatric facilities. And um, that was a wonderful achievement for us because those environments are even more heavily restricted and challenging to access any library resource. Um, so prisons are what I like to call information deserts. Those concrete walls that keep people in also keep knowledge and information out. They're heavily controlled environments, often subjected to media review policies, which is censorship. Um, and the censorship is required to maintain a lot of the social structure. And new ideas are often what are necessary for people to change the trajectory of their life. But in an environment that is designed to continue the status quo, new ideas can be harmful uh, in perpetuating some of those systems. So it's not often readily accessible uh, to, to have new ideas to because they they challenge the, those structures. Um, the way most knowledge has been brought into prison are in these readers. These are people who are incarcerated in California. And you'll see, which is the one of the largest uh, prison systems in, in, in the United States. And uh, when we think of California, we often think of Silicon Valley. We think of, you know, birthplace of the internet being mainstream. But you'll see that most of what these people have access to, it's paper-based. Um, when technology is available inside, it's often heavily surveilled. You'll see on the right, um, in order to log in, this person who is incarcerated has to submit to an iris scan. And then anything that this individual does while they are on that device it creates a log. Uh, uh, so if someone on the inside of, of a someone inside a prison is trying to look up something that might be controversial, just searching for that topic could put them at risk for a disciplinary infraction. For instance, if they're doing research on a uh, on papillon, uh, a, a common um, uh, uh, article or a, a book that is is commonly part of a higher education program uh, or a college curriculum. Um, someone in the prison might think that this person's trying to escape and they could be subjected to solitary confinement while the prison system decides if they were trying to escape or just trying to learn more about the the topic that they were studying. Um, tablets that you can see uh, being these handheld devices that you see um, here are very common inside of prisons in the United States. The United States leading in mass incarceration globally, you know, we have 5% of the global population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Um, and we're exporting that idea. We're also exporting the monetization of, of prisons and tablets are, are, are also being exported now as a, as a model to other countries. Um, people can uh, message, they often make phone calls, they send emails, but they also buy music, films, um, pay to play games and increasingly their library is limited to what is on this device um so prison libraries don't often contain uh if most of the prison libraries that are in existence they don't contain academic research they contain you know novels they contain some magazines 
occasionally newspapers. But if people are trying to explore new ideas, most prison libraries aren't equipped to deal with anything more than, you know, a paperback novel. Um, but with JSTOR, the largest digital academic library on the planet, we have been able to get on these devices in an ethical way where people can have access to knowledge and the prisons can maintain some control over that content. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about having tablets available inside is that people uh, are increasingly, um, you know, outside of prison need, need to use the internet or devices to conduct all sorts of aspects of, of daily life. So having tablets available inside, people are learning how to use these things for when they come home. In the United States, it is not uncommon for people to spend decades in prison, and it is entirely possible. Actually, it's not all that uncommon that there are people who are in prison who have never used a computer. They've been locked up since like 1995. And uh, so these devices, as they near the end of their prison term, make it easier for them to reintegrate back into success, back into society. And having JSTOR available, they're a little bit more prepared to understand fact from fiction. And especially now in the United States, disinformation is a real problem. And people being familiar with a way to source information, um, it's a really crucial tool for them to better understand the world that they're going to be released into, not just in a cultural sense, but also in, in the technological sense. Um, so this is uh, how JSTOR looks on a tablet, um, which looks exactly the same as it does for any student who's involved in higher education outside of the prison. And this is kind of how it works. So uh, people can conduct a search just like they would on a traditional college campus or in their home outside. It'll pull up all of the results. Um, but the difference is if it has, if the content hasn't already been approved, they would need to click this button and request it. And then a reviewer would evaluate it. If it's been approved, you can see over here, then um, they would be able to, to click on read and the article would come up just like it would for any other learner. And these have real world implications. So one person uh, said that um, they use lock-in time to surf JSTOR and, um, and they learned that half the things that they, they thought they knew about Paul Revere um, wasn't true. And then it made this person wonder, like, what else is out there that I believe that may or may not be true? And it, it, um, it's not uncommon for people who are incarcerated to feel like they're having conversations with with their own history and and able to contextualize how they arrived in prison like how did i get here um and that we believe that if people can understand themselves they can understand the systems that are are present in society well then they can come home and build stronger communities but that doesn't even have to we don't have to wait for people to come home because even though they're incarcerated they're part of a community and they need access to information and knowledge um and for the few people like 95 percent of people in the united states who are incarcerated are coming home uh only five percent are not expected to ever come home um but especially for the people who are expected to die in prison, prisons are their community. The people who live in those places are their community and they still have senses, a sense of community and they don't, they're not excluded from the need to understand themselves and the world and the community that they're a part of. So this is really very cool. Um, 
in uh, the United States with technology being so heavily surveilled and it's very slow to adapt on the inside. Um, and that's really important to understand because most of the technology, most of the way that libraries work or the way people um, get information out here, it's all based on the internet, right? So if the internet is heavily controlled and difficult to access, um, then the idea that they would be interacting with artificial intelligence is pretty, um, th the chances that they would be interacting with it are very low. And if they, um, and and the rules surrounding new technologies are very slow to adapt, but now AI is everywhere. So when um, we did this pilot for, um, for the Department of Corrections in this one state, you could see their usage was pretty flat. It was starting on the uptick. But then when students had access to our AI research assistant, which doesn't do the work for them, they put in their their search just like they would for anybody, for, for any topic. Um, but then the AI tool can translate the topic or the article into language that's easier to understand. The average literacy level of a person who is incarcerated in the United States is fourth grade. And most of the content in our library has been designed for people who have a degree or are pursuing um, a degree, uh, a post-secondary degree. And so uh, the, it's challenging for them to understand the content. But with the addition of the, the AI research assistant, it can summarize the content uh, to the literacy level that's most appropriate for the learner. And then look what it does, like people interact with more content uh, when they have a deeper understanding of what the material is. And it was um, it was really risky for the facility to do this uh, where, where we first piloted it. But it turns out that um, it actually made for a safer facility. I'll explain a little more about that later. Um, or I'll start now. Uh, the Hampton County Jail was the first county jail in the United States. There are several different types of of incarcer of carceral spaces. Uh, we have the federal level, like the U.S. government. Then we have state level carceral facilities, and then we have county jails and. The, the county jails have a little bit more flexibility uh, because they're smaller systems. And uh, this one jail was the first one that went with full JSTOR inside, uh, which means there was none of that monitoring. There was none of that, oh, you have to, uh, you know, request the article, then someone has to approve it. They just went full JSTOR, no moderation, no censorship. And the, the jail was very nervous about adding it because they had 20 students at the time and they only had five computer terminals. And they were afraid that being a limited resource that there would be fights. But the opposite thing happened is that people started working together. Hey, I'm working on a similar topic or my paper is due before yours is due. And they started, you know, sharing, they created a schedule for who could use the, the computers that had this resource. And that spirit of cooperation actually changed the culture of the education housing unit. And there were fewer fights. Um, this The sheriff uh, described it as a spirit of cooperation broke out. And when people had access to more knowledge and more information, they were able to resolve conflicts in a different way. And it was it was fascinating uh, to see how access, even limited access, where they had to learn how to share, changed the culture inside that facility. So um, the other thing that had changed in the United States that made JSTOR want to look at how we could support higher education in prison is um, that we, uh, 
we wanted to make sure that that not only JSTOR was available, but also that we weren't creating a new market to just charge people subscription fees. So if a student is a is if a student is is taking prison classes of a university or college that already has a JSTOR subscription, that JSTOR subscription covers that student in prison. And we don't charge anything extra. This is a service that we provide to ensure that all members of that student body have access to the same information and knowledge, whether they're in a prison classroom or in a classroom on the main college campus. Um, and by not monetizing it, uh, by not charging extra because people are in prison, we've been able to demonstrate to other, other parts of the ecosystem that this isn't a space that you can just add a bunch of fees for. Um, this isn't a market to be exploited. And it's changed the way other um, textbook providers, for instance, have shown up in this space. And that feels really good. We didn't intend to be a market leader in that way, but it evolved that way because we're we're kind of a, a large player in this ecosystem. We don't want to incentivize incarceration. Um, if this is of interest to you about the technology that's available in higher education and prison programs and the way these things sort of work um, and why it is such a problem that people don't have access to um, technology and information sharing resources like JSTOR, this um, report will, will explain a lot of that to you if it's interesting to you. Um, this, these are just all the countries that we are in. I, I thought this group might um, might be interested. JSTOR itself is in 191 countries. Depends on, you know, everyone kind of has a different uh, total of how many countries there actually are. We are in nearly all of them. Um, but JSTOR access in prison, um, are in in now 21 countries it's kind of exciting but um out of the the ones on this map four are in test mode so that just means the prison is still working through um through some some issues before they make it available everywhere um and these are are some student perspectives about how once they have access to information and knowledge inside the prison, um, how it affected how it affected them. And my favorite one is the last one, where the guys like I use JSTOR for everything: legal work, classwork, and arguing with my my cellmate, um, because it just shows how they have um, kind of changed from a confrontational mode to a debate mode when they have access to knowledge. Um, and that concludes um, this presentation. Um, one thing that I'd also like to share that I didn't include in here is um, we had um, someone reach out to us from Zimbabwe um, and they didn't have uh, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have computers. Um, sometimes they didn't have reliable electricity in this prison. On the, It was like on the border with Botswana. So it was very far from the capital. It was like four hours from the capital. And, um, you know, and, and very similar, something very similar happened in, in Spain. And so it's not, really um we kind of did it to see if we we could do it but we worked with several partners IBM donated some computers uh Starlink donated internet access and a solar company donated panels and a battery pack so that we had a way to get the internet inside this 
facility with reliable energy and and power, you know, between the solar and the battery pack. And all of that took about a year, but we they now have a computer lab in this prison in the middle of nowhere in Botswana, or excuse me, in uh, Zimbabwe on the border with Botswana. And uh, once people had access to, to JSTOR in there, and they were able to learn all kinds of really cool, interesting things that are in the archive. Um, they did things like build a public health program inside that enabled them to uh, have access to basic health information. And um, the, the, the jailers also used JSTOR to look at best practices and, hey, maybe we could be looking at some of these problems through a different lens. And it changed possibilities inside. And uh, I just think that it's really important sometimes to take a step back and look at the ecosystems of knowledge sharing and how information travels. Because what, what we need to consider is that the new information that can come in through those concrete walls um, it has a, a, it reverberates back out. Um, one of the projects that we'd been working on with um, the, with Wikipedia uh, was, you, you know, with artificial intelligence needing more content and more data to learn, we realized that um, Wikipedia is one of the most common sources for artificial intelligence, like large language models to learn from. And which is great because, you know, the, the Wikipedia model of um, uh, crowdsourcing knowledge, it's, it's really valuable. Um, but people who are incarcerated who can't access it or contribute to it, that's a that's a huge reservoir of knowledge that is untapped. It's completely absent from the um from the from the Wikipedia uh, content. And it's not Wikipedia's fault because these environments are designed to be restrictive. And uh, when we think about uh, the professor and the madman, if anyone's familiar with the way the uh, first Webster's, I believe it was Webster's dictionary, was um, archived, um, it was someone in a uh, mental institution who defined, like, I think 17,000 words uh, or more in the Webster's dictionary. And he did it from, from a psychiatric facility. And so there's a lot of knowledge in those spaces that also needs to get out. And that's kind of the next step is how can we make this bi-directional? How can we incorporate that knowledge and, and opinion and, and that culture? How can we, make it more readily accessible to people who are outside. And so that's a focus for for me um, looking forward or looking into our future. Um, that's all. So if you have any questions, I am so happy to be here with you all and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the work we're doing. Thank you, Stacey. Before we conclude, I would like to open the floor for any questions that you may have. Please, please. Please feel free to share your questions or reflections in today's discussion. The floor is open to any questions uh, that you might have for the speaker. Just dive right in. It's a small enough group. I see someone with their hand up.
you please go ahead yeah uh, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation and uh, the laptops and um, tablets etc is there any case study have you done um, in in the asian region or maybe in the sark region uh, uh, i am just interested to know that thank you sure i i heard the beginning and then it was quiet and then i heard are you in the south region <laughs> so uh, could you repeat the question no actually i was just uh, first appreciating about your efforts uh, about you know providing knowledge to to the prisoners even the prisoners who, who who are technically away from the current scenario what is going around the world and they also have rights to uh, get the knowledge and the second question is like uh, you know, since i, I have see, I, i have heard that you have lots of uh, sponsors like like starlink and others who are uh, basically supporting this initiative uh we are interested maybe like couple of the people over here may be interested in implementing uh, such initiative in maybe in our sark region so uh, uh, what would be the right steps or how we can approach uh, uh, yeah or if you ever had uh, some some case study uh, in this region so i am just interested to know about that thank you got it uh thank you for that um so India has uh I I don't know much about the prison system there. I do know that there are two facilities that each one has like 100,000 people in them. I don't know anything about what happens inside of them or like I don't know what technology they have or education or what opportunities are there for us to to help um but uh but we'll go anywhere i mean it's 2:30 in the morning uh in new york where i am and um you know we've we're interested we believe that globally everybody should have this regardless of where they are and we would um make it available um to anyone who wants it and inside of the the facilities there we'd have to take a look to find a a solution that could work but sometimes it's the beginning of something and like wow we could we could have this we could do this thing um in this facility and it opens up other possibilities uh for uh sometimes culture sharing like we learned so much about Zimbabwe uh from doing that project with them and I want to be clear that like we made a bunch of phone calls to be to ask um different people or different companies that could have um a a really important role in in advancing the access to knowledge in such a remote challenged facility but even in the United States a lot of the problems that we encountered in in some of these african countries they're present in our own country there are pockets that have very similar problems they don't have a reliable electrical grid they don't have um you know access to devices and so we we shouldn't think that because india might look different from us that it's so different because we have those same problems here we've done some work with some indigenous um you know uh, uh communities as a result of this work because we realized that you know the indian reservations that we have here are very similarly situated to the problems that were encountered in zimbabwe so that was a long answer to say that i think there's a lot of differences between what an implementation could look like um but there are a lot of companies and organizations that are interested in sponsoring this type of work 
And we're happy to roll up our sleeves right alongside you if anyone is interested to figure out what we can do to overcome some of those challenges and find a solution. Um, because a, a library, it's really important. And an academic library with the stores of centuries or really millennia of, of knowledge, um, everybody should have access to that. Um, but especially in places where they they don't have the the like the people inside don't have the autonomy like there's that there's a saying in the United States that um you don't know what you don't know and and once that is cracked open um each person can have a little bit more autonomy by pursuing things that are interesting to them and um and we think that it's a great equalizer when people have access to the same knowledge um and so as an organization we're committed to helping you find those solutions so no we haven't done anything in india would we love to absolutely um because just like any other country or or community that we think is at risk because they don't have access to knowledge we'd like to do what we can to help Thank you, Stacey. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question then. Uh, so uh, you said like understanding life beyond the prison walls is essential for is essential for reentry for the people who are incarceration. So with tools like AI translation and all that access to educational content. Uh, how does JSTOR help bridge this knowledge gap? I mean, the, like you said, the Hampton County, uh, the, they have full access to the JSTOR uh, uh, facilities, so uh, available without restrictions. So what impact has this had in places like the Hampton County, uh, this bridging of the gap for reentry? So... Um... So reentry is is a really tough time because people have to um, get their whole life together. When people leave prison, at least in the United States, they have no money, they have no health care, they have no place to live in most cases. They have um, they have often a lot of uh, rejection from the community. And because once they have a criminal conviction, it's really challenging to get a job in, in, in the United States. And so JSTOR is helpful in a couple of ways. First, in an increasingly tech-driven society, they've interacted, like they've learned how to find information. The information literacy, um, the, the value of information literacy can't be overstated, not just knowing how the tech works, but then how to make the tech work for you. So they have muscle memory that I can use a search bar. I can put something in there. I can put keywords in and I can find what I need. So if they need to find a food pantry, if they need to find a way to get uh, public benefits, like in, uh, we have Medicaid here, but it's all done online. They at least know that they can click and what the enter bar does and, and how to search for things. So it makes it easier for them to navigate, um, you know, regular, like Google when they come home. For many people who are incarcerated, JSTOR is their Google. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we we don't collect individual user data for a lot of reasons. We don't do it on our main platform uh, for anyone learning um, outside of prison. We don't do it for people in prison. But we can see collectively what people are searching for. And like the third most common inquiry that we have is what is Bitcoin, <laughs> which is because they, they can't just go to the internet and find it. Um, so they can find some things about, um, you know, uh, cultural things or what's happening in the world. So even if they don't have money to buy Bitcoin, they know what it is. They have an idea of what cryptocurrency is. And if someone went to prison in 2005, um, 
then, you know, none of like cryptocurrency didn't even exist then, but they at least have some familiarity. So think about that. If someone says, hey, you can invest in this thing. And if they only have $10, like, you know, you could be a gajillionaire if you put $10 into this thing and um, they'll be able to know if it's true or not. Like, Um, they, they're less likely to be taken in, they're less gullible because they know how to go and find information. And in reentry, when the world looks very different than the world that you left, um, knowing a little bit about what's happening in the world reliably, not opinion, not disinformation, it's just easier to navigate. So you have the Uh, familiarity with the technology that's being used, and then also how to use it to get reliable information that you want and or or that you need um, to accomplish whatever your goal is, whether it's housing, food, um, getting health care. Those are all uh, increasingly delivered online. So and during reentry, when you have all of these overwhelming needs with very few resources, Most people aren't like, you know, JSTOR is very low on their hierarchy of needs, but they know where to go to find truth. They know where to go to find fact. And that's a really powerful tool in your back pocket when you're trying to figure out what your new life post-release is going to look like. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that Most of the facilities that have JSTOR, um, they don't have full JSTOR like Hampton County. Uh, there are a few state, there are a few places that do, um, but uh, the majority bulk approve almost everything. They might approve everything except for geography because they're afraid if people have a map of the area they can escape or it'll make escape more successful uh, they don't often approve human health because they uh, don't want you know pictures of the human body like unclothed human bodies are very scary to departments of corrections. So they don't bulk approve human human health. But the majority of sites approve, you know, easily 75 to 80 percent of the archive. So people don't have to ask permission to access any of that content, like law, economics, language. Um, they don't have to to ask permission for any of those things. And in that way, It also mimics uh, like the immediate access to the content that also mimics the uh, the way search engines work out here. So they're um, they're just much better attuned to the immediacy of the availability of information in a modern society. Thank you so much for clarifying. Now we have a question from Mr. Afi. Uh, he wants to know about some of the ideal suggestions that you might have for the institutions, affiliates, and other bodies in the Wikimedia ecosystem, considering the restrictedness that you earlier mentioned. Great question. So um, I will tell you that I tell like everybody um, about the offline um Uh, index that uh, Wikipedia has, the the offline version that's available on the raspberries, um, because they can plug that into a server. Um, and also Wikipedia for high school, it's like 5,000 articles, but they're pre-screened for content that's appropriate for secondary education, like high schools. And so I'm like, if it's okay in a high school, then these grown adults can readily access this content. If it's okay for somebody in ninth grade to have it, people in prison who are adults can have it. And so um, Wikipedia for high schools is really common um, inside prisons and it often sits alongside JSTOR. Uh, I believe that the other uh, beautiful thing about uh, Wikipedia 
is that it um, it's more accessible language and people can find things that are more culturally relevant. You're not going to find a whole lot of interesting stuff about like Jay-Z, uh, who's really popular in uh, for people who are in prison. You're not going to find that in JSTOR um, unless it's about, you know, the media empire that Jay-Z built or the economic value of a Jay-Z concert. But people who are inside who are new to accessing information and using, um, you know, JSTOR as their Google they can um, find things that they care about more readily on Wikipedia. So Wikimedia, Wikipedia is well situated. I've worked with um, Jake Orlowitz in making Wikipedia more available inside. And I know he's had some talks with the Wikipedia Foundation about what they might be able to do to support the work. At one point, we were thinking about making Uh, a, a category within JSTOR of Wikipedia, like we could just stick it right into our prison, um, our prison platform. Um, but we, we were like, that's not really going to solve anything because people then when they come home, they're going to think they have to go to JSTOR to get to Wikipedia and it'll create confusion. But we believe that it belongs right alongside JSTOR in this environment, and we do everything that we can um, to get it out there. Um, I mentioned um, Spain in the Catalonia region, um, in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere in northern Spain. Um, they can't get they can't get Starlink because of the mountainous terrain, but they have. Um, The, the Raspberry, they have the Wikipedia index, thanks to Jake, who, who, uh, who set them all up. So um, I think that with a little bit of creativity, um, with a little bit of creativity, um, we could do a, a tremendous amount um, by, by slipping Wikipedia into the, into that ecosystem. The other thing that is In incredibly valuable about those raspberries um, is that um, uh, JSTOR is mostly PDFs. Well, it's all PDFs. And that takes up a lot of space and a lot of memory. So when the internet is not available, JSTOR is not the best solution to get more information inside because those PDFs take up a lot of valuable space. And in no time, I think the whole archive, if you were to take the whole archive and try to duplicate it, it's like a terabyte and no server in a prison and a technologically backwards environment. They, they can't accommodate that and it's not cost effective. But since Wikipedia's offline versions are all text, you can cram a lot of information into onto a server um, in a way that JSTOR simply can't. So in those environments, Wikipedia is a better option. And we routine when we come across it and they're just not ready to do anything bigger, you know, maybe it's, you know, money, maybe it's, you know, fear, whatever the the barrier is. Um, Wikipedia can slip right into that ecosystem much more readily than JSTOR can. And right. And um, so right now, when I come across those instances, I refer them over to Jake and Jake's been doing that like at no charge. Like he doesn't charge for his time. He's not making any money. Um, you know, he's not, um, Uh, charging for for any of his his time and energy and and making those um uh making those things a reality but if the foundation supported that work um you know there's over 10 million people on this planet who are incarcerated and jstor is not going to be able to do it alone to reach them to get them access to knowledge But um, but I think that you're actually better positioned with a little bit of support um, uh, 
with a little bit of just a little bit of money goes really far <laughs> in this space. Um, I think it could be life changing for those 10 million people. Thanks a lot. If we do not have any more questions, uh, we can uh, in conclude the session. Okay. Thank you so much, Stacey, for your insightful session on how JSTOR is helping bring knowledge to people in prison. Your thoughts on using digital resources, balancing access with safety, and the positive impact on inmates' learning were eye-opening. These efforts will surely help incarcerated individuals work together and get ready for a life after prison. Thank you. Thank you. I put my contact um, information in the chat if anyone wants to discuss this further. I'm happy to.